Hey guys, let's get started. Uh, I dim down the light a little bit. I, I want to show you a video later on. So not at the beginning, but later on. We're going to watch uh, uh, a longer video today. Um, this week, I want to talk to you about experiments. I'll come back to that in a second. But uh, before we get started with that, just a reminder to get you back after the break. By the way, I hope you had a great break. Yeah. Uh, I had a, one of those breaks where I was just so excited to get some work done uh, because, let's face it, teaching this is a lot of work and uh, my other stuff, you know, writing papers and so on. So uh, we have to do this at other times. But I hope you had a nice break. And now we are back in here with our lecture and how cool is that you already have a new assignment uh, for next week. So I put it up on the blackboard yesterday so you find it there. Another thing to keep in mind before I start with the lecture, you know, it's, it's, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. You now we have four weeks left. We have four weeks left of the term. The time is running by very quickly. We cover a lot of material, and the exam is coming up at some point. Yeah. So what I did uh, to help you prepare for that a little bit, uh, on Blackboard you find a test exam. It's a test exam that I had prepared last year. So that you already get a feeling for how the exam is going to look like. It's not going to be dramatically different. Uh, um, but obviously it will be different. But the kind of style will be very similar to that. So I already put that on Blackboard. But we'll talk more about that as we go along. But keep in mind, you know, it's only four weeks left of the term. And time uh, goes by very quickly. So I will talk more about that later on during the, during the lecture, where I also give you a, an exam preparation guide about what, how exactly best you could prepare for the exam. Anyway, so let's get started with today's lecture. So this week I want to talk to you about experiments. Experiments in the social sciences. And when you hear experiments, you think about something like this. Yeah. You think about the sciences. This is actually the Large Hadron Collider. This is the, uh, the ATLAS detector in CERN. If you're like a physics geek, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is basically a particle accelerator. This is what you think of an experiment. Yeah. But actually, we can do incredibly good experiments in the social sciences as well. Yeah, and that's sort of what, what I want to talk to you about this week. Yeah. It's also not just in the hard sciences, or maybe you heard about experiments in psychology or clinical trials or things like that. But actually, in sociology, we can do really, really good experiments. And actually, it's when you remember we talked about uh, causality and all these difficulties that you have around that, in that context, experiments are really the gold standard because they allow you to get to causality. Because you're changing something, and then whatever you observe in terms of change afterwards must be due to the thing that you changed. So that's sort of like the key. And we can do these kind of things in the social sciences as well. Because at the end of the day, it really is about this. Yeah. It's about giving one half a blue pill and about giving another half a red pill, as straightforward as it is. Yeah. That is what we call a treatment and a control. And then you observe the differences between that. OK, but we'll talk more about that on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, I will jump more into uh, experimental designs. You know, well, you can complicate things, it's not that strict, but that's sort of like the core at, at, in, in that, that is there that you have a control and a treatment, but you can complicate things a little bit. And uh, I will talk more about that on Wednesday. Today what I want to do, I want to give you a feeling for what are these kind of experiments in the social sciences. Yeah. To have you understand how experiments can actually work in sociology. So I brought these five examples uh, with me today. Let's see if we manage to talk about all of them. And uh, each one is about an experiment that I found really cool in the social sciences. OK, so let's get started with the very first experiment. Actually, this is an experiment that I did with you guys just a few weeks ago. Remember, I split the lecture theater in half. One half of you was in the black group. The other half of you was in the white group. And I had you answer questions on Mentimeter like we do all the time, these kind of things, but one half kind of they pinched in the code for the black group and the other half pinched in the code for the, for the white group. And when you look at it, the question was exactly the same. The question was exactly the same, but what was my treatment here or what was the difference that I had? Well, it was in the answer categories. 
Now, if you remember, uh, when you look a little closer on the, in the white group, the answer categories, they are, they are much, more, uh, um, much more wide, they are much more spread out in a way, uh, while, in the, while in the black group they were more narrow. You know, more than 90 minutes was like at the very far right, while more than 90 minutes was much more to the left in the white group. And the striking result that we had here was that in the one group, in the white group, 47% of, of you guys said you, that you spent more than 98 minutes on Facebook, if I just add up these numbers. While for the black group, we only had 80% of people who said they spent more than 90 minutes on Facebook. There was no real difference between the two groups here, right? That was like, and that's already the logic of an experiment. That's already the logic of an experiment that I assumed in this case here now that there's sort of like a random allocation of you guys to either to the one side or to the other side. And then the treatment that I had here was that I gave you different answer categories. I gave answer categories to one group and to the other group. So any difference that I observed between these two things, not to speak about how much time people spend on Facebook in general, but talking about this difference between these two groups must be due to the difference that I gave to those two groups. Because that's the only thing that is different there. Of course, there could be some variation. Yeah, I don't know, for whatever reason, uh, the one group says 50%, the other side says 40% or whatnot. Yeah. But here we find a huge striking difference that we cannot explain with these random fluctuations anymore. Actually, we could do a statistical test, and I did a statistical test on this. Um, this is not just a fluke. Yeah. This was an experiment. This was a very straightforward experiment where, that we did live and where you actually saw the output. We did this in another context. We did this in the context of question uh, categories and question wording and question ordering and things like that. But this is an experiment. And this is sort of how the design here looks like. You know? At the end, I had uh, all of you guys, you know, that's sort of how it started. I split you up in the white group and in the, um, and in the black group, and I gave you different answer categories for exactly the same question, you know, then I had you fill out this question, like how much time do you spend on Facebook, and then I observed the difference. I compared the two results that I got. That's an experimental design in a nutshell. Yeah? So I could have done some, uh, some other things as well. I could have measured, I don't know, things before, and then do something, and then measure things again. That's sort of like another setup that would be like a, uh, uh, like a, uh, pre-post design, but this is just a post design, but we'll talk more about that on, on Wednesday, where I just measure something after I've administered the treatment. Yeah, and the treatment here was different answer categories to the one group compared to the other group. That's an experiment. Okay, I have another experiment that I now want to talk to you about, and uh, this is sort of like where, where I want to show this video, um, which is about an experiment that was conducted in a school class. Uh, so it's in an educational context. So I thought, okay, maybe not all of you are going to be end up academics. Uh, maybe you end up in some educational context or whatnot. And this is a very, very powerful experiment. It might not be the best one in terms of design, but it's nevertheless very, very powerful. And it actually, uh, there's a full documentary on this. Uh, so um, I put the link on Blackboard already it was a documentary broadcasted on PBS Frontline. And it's, it's quite old, you know, it was actually shot in the 1970s. And uh, it's about uh, a situation of a class teacher uh, who, wanted to, who wanted to teach, I think was it third graders, about racial discrimination. And it was right after the murder of Martin Luther King. So it was in the 1960s, at the end of the 1960s. Martin Luther King, a famous a civil rights movement leader, you know, if you don't, if you don't remember. And uh, so he was shot, and uh, back in the 1960s, uh, there was like huge, huge racial discrimination in the, U in the United States. It's actually hard to believe, but you know, it was very, like crazy, or segregation, like black hats, black hats, uh, black people had to sit at some part of the bus while white people uh, were, uh, had to sit at other parts of the bus, and things like that. Had to use different toilets, you yeah. know. Uh, crazy things, if you think about it, you know, it's not too long ago. And uh, so here the idea was to, was to, was to 
bring that up in the context of these third graders. So it's an experiment, so I'm just going to show you this video. It's a bit of a longer video. It's like 15 minutes, but nevertheless, I think it's very powerful, which is why I wanted to show you the whole thing. Yeah. So I'm going to switch over, and then we're going to watch this video together. Don't 
go and get that cup and put your name on it and keep it at your desk. Blue-eyed people are wasteful. Do you want any time this morning? Yeah. Hey. I use Orton Gun and Fonix. We use the card pack. And the children, the brown-eyed children, were in the whole class the first day. And it took them five and a half minutes to get to the card pack. The second day, it took them two and a half minutes. The only thing that had changed was the fact that now they were superior people. I'm going to give you more faster than I've ever had anyone go to the card pack. Why, why couldn't you get them yesterday? <coughs> Sorry for the sound, simply this university and technical equipment, I can write a book about it. But, uh, um, okay, a couple of things about this, about, this, uh, about this video that I showed you. Well, but besides the fact that it's very powerful, I think, it's very intense and it's, it's a clever way of I don't know, showing the third graders about what discrimination is about, yeah? or actually just to see this happening. But for us, this is relevant for two other reasons. 
Well, first of all, um, can you imagine how ethical this is? Nowadays, you couldn't do this. Right? If I would do something like this, I don't know, they would throw me out of this university here. Yeah? This is border, borderline unethical, yeah? how they treat those children at the time. And nowadays, if I want to study children like this, you know, I need to be vetted by the GADA and everything like that. So it's a completely different process, uh, luckily. But, uh, but it's, it's very interesting. So the, the part that, that where really the experiment comes into play, maybe you kind of paid attention. Uh, well, first of all, you know, there was this obvious separation between blue-eyed and, and brown-eyed kids, right, where the teacher basically told them. So basically, this is what the teacher controlled. The teacher controlled saying to blue-eyed people that they are better, right? saying to brown-eyed people that they are worse. And if you keep in mind about trying to match that to me, assigning you to different groups and asking you about different Facebook times and so on, there's no reason, there's no real reason why brown-eyed or blue-eyed people should be better. Right? It's complete bullocks. Yeah? There's, no, there's no reason for something like this. So we know if there are differences, it must be you. It must be due to what the teacher did. Okay, so that was the first part of this, like separating those kids into different groups. But then maybe you paid attention later on during the, during the documentary, she talked about these card tests that she did with those kids, you know, where they had to do a certain task and uh, it took them, the, the, um, the, the brown eyed people, you know, they were worse the first day, it took them five minutes, and the second day it took them two minutes. Big difference, yeah? While when we look at the blue-eyed people, they completed the task the first day in three minutes, and the second day it took them four and a half minutes. Actually, design-wise, this is an even more interesting design. It's not just that we measure something after we assign the treatment, we measure something before and after, in a way. And then we can look at the difference here. And then it's very straightforward. You know, there you actually see there's no reason why the brown-eyed kids should be, uh, should be better. Well, actually, there's a reason maybe because everybody sort of gets better over time. Yeah? So uh, that's sort of, you could explain uh, why the brown-eyed kids are better in the second day, but it doesn't explain why the blue-eyed kids are worse the second day, because it would hold for everybody in the same way. Right? If it's about something about learning in time, everybody should be better in the second day, but it's not the case. So this is something where something was measured before and then afterwards, but the kind of the key part here was that, okay, we measure something after we assign individuals to certain groups, we administer certain treatment to them, and then we kind of compare uh, the, what, we, what we measured on them after we administered the treatment. That's an experiment. Of course, I don't know, there are lots of things you can, you can question about this experiment here, uh, you know, the ethics of it. Then the next thing of it is actually, you know, I don't know, there's a lot of other things happening, going on, you know, it's not as controlled, but how much can you control third graders, right? But uh, some people would say, hey, you, laboratory environments, you need to have it very much controlled and make sure that nothing else happens, yeah? that there's no, I don't know, conversation or what else, or something else happening and so on. So um, in that sense, but nevertheless, it's, it shows that it's an experimental design. And the key here is that you split people into groups, you administer treatments to the one group and something else to the other, and then you, in this case, they do this hard test and then you measure how long they take. So we know the difference here must be due to the treatment. Because in this case, I don't know, there's no, there's no good reason, or actually what often we do, we, we randomly allocate people, but you cannot randomly give somebody an eye color. Right? So here the idea is that, I don't know, that was sort of randomly allocated somehow, or at least independently of, uh, of, of, of how clever kids are. You know? There's no real reason why uh, some eye color should make you more clever than another one. But that's sort of like a, like a design like of, of a research uh, um, experiment in the social sciences, yeah, in sociology. Okay, so let's move on. I have a, a few other experiments. Let me talk about them as well. The next one that I want to talk about is about the spread of disorder. Disorder, or actually why I'm showing you this, because we also call this broken window theory. Here the idea is that when you walk by a place and somebody really threw in a window, you're more likely to throw in a window as well. Because why? Who the fuck cares? Yeah? It's already broken. Yeah? People already violate the norm. Why should I follow the norm? If nobody else does the assignment, why should I do it? 
That's sort of like this idea of, and actually in criminology, it's a very powerful idea, that disorder is contagious, that crime is contagious. That when, when your neighbors or when your friends disobey, you're more likely to disobey as well. And this is an experiment designed around that, to show that. Actually, you know, I, I want to show you this because this is a social science paper or social science experiment that was published in Science. You know, that's sort of like arguably one of the two top journals in the world in the academic business here. And so with these kind of very simple experiments, uh, you can have a really big impact, I think. And the nice thing about these experiments, which is why I talk about them here, is because I think they are very powerful and extremely simple at the same time. Okay, so broken window theory, I already mentioned that, you know, it's basically this idea that when you see signs of disorder like broken windows or litter or graffiti and so on, that that induces other types of disorder and pity crime. So if there's a lot of rubbish around it, why should you follow the norms? Why should you behave? And uh, you can see maybe where I'm going with this because this can be very powerful in terms of, I don't know, having an impact on changing, I don't know, how much crime there is in certain neighborhoods. Because here the argument would be, let's clean up that neighborhood. Let's clean up the playground. Let's clean up the streets. Let's remove the rubbish and so on. Because maybe if that is the case, but that kind of puts people in a certain stage where they feel, okay, norms are already being broken. Why should I not break any other norms? Right? By doing so, changing the first thing uh, could, into, could reduce crime overall. Now, so that's basically the idea, or the idea in that paper was that this, you know, like dropping something, leads to even more rubbish on the ground. In this case, you know, now we're not talking about huge crime, but we're talking about you know, some disorder, the spread of disorder. And the idea of the paper was then, okay, uh, just giving cues that one norm is broken, and they call that the contextual norm, uh, can that lead to other norms being broken as well? Basically, can we make people a little more by throwing something on the ground in the first instance. And they did this experiment in Groningen, and there's a picture of Groningen, in Groningen, a nice city in the Netherlands, of the great university, great sociology department, which I know a couple of people there. And uh, they did this experiment about littering, you know, about throwing things on the floor. And you see how this actually works. This is a field experiment now. Yeah? This is not like a lab experiment, this is a field experiment. So this is happening in the real world. This is happening in the real world. So basically, you know, in the Netherlands, if you've ever been there, there are lots of bikes. There are tons of bikes. There are bikes everywhere. People cycle around. It's crazy. When you walk around, you really watch out for yourself. Uh, because they just ignore you as a, as a pedestrian. Anyway, so what they did, there were all those bikes. And they put a flyer on the top of those bikes. They attached a flyer to the bikes. And it was like a stupid little flyer, which looked like advertisement from this sports company, which was nowhere nearby. It was like a fake flyer, right, that they kind of attached to those bikes. Yeah. And the flyer said, we wish you everybody happy holidays, or something like that, sports company, blah, 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 and so on. Yeah. So they attached that to the bikes. And now they are, Ultimately, what they're going to do, and you can see how creative this is, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, they measure how many people throw down that flyer on the floor. That's social science. They kind of measure how much do people disobey a norm, which is not to throw something on the floor. Okay, and how do they, how do they invoke this idea that other norms are already being broken? Yeah, because now the idea is, when something else is broken, another norm is violated, then people are more likely to violate something else. So what do they do? You know, sometimes I'm really jealous of how I don't know, cool research they can do. At the weekends, those researchers, they went out and they put graffiti on the walls. That was their research design. They put graffiti at the walls where the bikes were standing, and they looked at how many people throw down the flyers before they put the graffiti on the wall and after they put the graffiti at the wall. This is actually how it looks like. This is in, the, in, the, in this Ting Tang Street in Groningen. You know, first they had the order condition, now you see it. You know, they were sort of like, the bikes were standing, you even see the flyers attached to the bikes. And now you see this sign in the background, it says no graffiti. And there is no graffiti. That's the order condition. So now they go and measure how many people throw down the flyer here. Now they have the disorder condition. 
which is basically the treatment. Yeah. What did they do? This is sort of where overnight they put some crappy graffiti at the wall. Actually, they even describe in the paper how they made efforts to make it look really crappy. Yeah. So that it doesn't look good. Yeah. So that it looks clearly like some shitty graffiti they put there at the wall. And there's the sign, no graffiti, but it's obviously violated. <coughs> right? So now this is sort of the case where, where there's a clear norm. It's being, 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 being made very explicit through the sign, no graffiti. And it's clearly broken. Yeah. There is graffiti at the wall. This is sort of how the design looks like. Again, this is sort of like a similar graph, and you'll see some similar graphs later on as well. So, you know, flyers attached to the bikes, the order condition and the disorder condition. And then afterwards, they basically were really sitting there at the top, or I don't know, in this room, and counted how many people throw down the flyer on the floor. Yeah. It's, it's pretty cool research, I think. Yeah. And then they compared the numbers. What do you think they found? Well, they found a huge difference. They found a huge difference. So in the order condition, where there was no graffiti at the wall, 33% of the people threw down the flyer on the floor. While in the disorder condition, the only thing that was different, it was sort of like the same time of the year, it was just over one night and there was no difference in terms of weekday or weekend or something like that. Right? So it was sort of like comparable, there was no real reason to think that there would be different people walking by. And, uh, um, but the only thing that was different was that now this norm, no graffiti, was clearly broken. And now 69% of the people threw the flyer on the floor. You see this? Twice as many people. Again, this is sort of an experiment that kind of nicely shows, and they argue in that paper that once this one norm is broken, that this makes people more likely to break another norm. And it has to be due to the graffiti, because that's the only thing that is different here. Nothing else is different. So you see all those other things that, that I might not know about, or we call that unobserved heterogeneity, you know, like things that matter, but you don't really see them. You don't observe it. Yeah? But these things should matter equally for both conditions. It's the same thing with me splitting you up into two groups. There are lots of different things that might matter for, I don't know, some people spending more time on Facebook uh, than other people. Yes, that's absolutely true. But all those different things should matter equally for the people sitting on this side and on that side. That's the whole idea of random allocation that we have here, that all the things that you don't observe, they matter equally. And that's a pretty neat design, because then when somebody else says, well, but something else, you didn't look at that, and they say, well, I did look at it in the way that it should matter equally for everybody. So there's no reason why that whatever I didn't observe should have caused, should have caused the difference that I see. Unless it's sort of correlated with, I don't know, people sitting on that side have certain characteristics or attributes, and people sitting on the other side have other attributes or characteristics. So anyway, so in this case, this was the result. You know, uh, there was a clear difference between littering, uh, depending on graffiti. You know, and being a good researcher, you know, I was actually giving a talk in uh, Groningen not too long ago. When you're drunk in the middle of the night, that's what you do. You go to the Ting Tang Street and you drop something. Yeah. This is the road, just from another angle, but anyway. So, this is a really cool paper. It's a really cool paper. Um, there's another experiment about trespassing. So maybe I. Um, I have two more. Maybe I'm not quite sure. Okay, let me talk about let me talk about this about the trespassing experiment, and we won't have time to talk about the cultural markets experiment most likely. But uh, the tr trespassing experiment was done by the same authors, it's the same paper, published in Science. Yeah. Now we have another, so basically what they do, they want to show now, okay, we have a very general idea here, which is that this order spreads. Yeah. A contextual norm is being broken, that makes it more likely that a target norm, something else is being broken as well, it gets broken as well. Yeah, that's the idea. So they showed this with those flyers. If there is a very general point here, this very general point should hold true in other contexts too. And that's sort of how you approach this. Or at least, I don't know, if you want to get published in science, this is what you need to do. You need to not just have this one thing, but you need to show it in different contexts as well. So I, they ran six different experiments. I'm just going to talk about the second one that they have here. So here, the target norm was trespassing or no trespassing. There was a clear sign. This is like a private property, or actually it was a parking lot, a private parking lot. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't trespass. There was a clear sign here. The way they try to 
to, to, to basically impose the breaking of, of the norm was with a contextual norm that was about not attaching a bike to a fence. Here you actually see it, so there were clear signs, don't trespass, no trespassing, and no attaching of bikes to the fence. Now if you, have, if you understood some Dutch, there was actually the picture that I showed in the first instance. Yeah. Uh, um, so in the order condition, the bikes were not attached to the fence, but on a bike rack next to the fence. Yeah? So that norm wasn't broken. But in the disorder condition, instead of attaching the bikes to the bike rack, they were attached to the fence, clearly breaking that norm. So again, it's like the same setup, you know, like, I don't know, and they actually see the sign, you know, they see the two signs, and not just passing, and the, and the game that feeds in, on head hanging, rest parking, you know, that's my Dutch, it always sounds a little cute to me. Um, anyway, and uh, what they did, researchers, you know, they basically were hiding and kind of observed how many people trespass when the bikes are attached to the fence or when they're not attached to the fence. Again, it's sort of like the same logic, there's no real difference here. Uh, except that this one, that this bikes are now attached to the fence, which breaks the norm, because that's also the sign that bikes shouldn't be attached to the fence. But everything else was the same. Or there's no real reason to assume that people walking by in the one at one time are kind of different from the people that walk by when the bikes were not attached to it. What do they find? Is that only 27% of the people who wanted to pick up their car, you know, it was like, like this parking lot, and clearly kind of going through this, this parking thing was like a shortcut in a way. So it would have made sense for everybody to cut through, you know. So the, or there was an incentive for people to cut through, but only 27% of the people did so when there was uh, the, the order condition, meaning there were no bikes attached to the fence yeah. next to where they could have squeezed through the fence. While 82% of the people, they kind of stepped through that gap when those bikes were attached to the fence and that norm was being broken. Okay. So you see, again, it's sort of like a really neat design in a way to show like how, even in this case, like one breaking one norm, the context norm or one norm being broken can make people more likely to break another norm, the spread of disorder. Yeah. And it's a huge difference. So this is like a very, very powerful, very powerful um, experiment. So I had another experiment about cultural markets, um, but I think we're running out of time. I might talk about that on Wednesday. But on Wednesday, I'm going to come back to this. So this is just to give you an idea about experiencing the social sciences and how cool they can be. And uh, on Wednesday, we'll talk more about the nitty gritty details of it. And please do the readings for that. Yeah? Okay, see you on the next one.